Hey, David. Hi. Hey, I'm very glad to have you on. I want to, you know, I'm, I'm eager to learn your 10 question approach to uh, evaluating investments. Um, so before we get into that, it's just a quick intro about what David's all about. Uh, David, you have a podcast of your own called uh, Money for the Rest of Us so that has, I think it's over 10 million downloads. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Oh, wow, that's super impressive. Uh, you also, your investment advice has been featured, I think, uh, in a lot of well-known publications, New York Times, Forbes, Business Insider, um, just really great stuff. And uh, you have a book coming out. Is that right? I do. At the uh, end of October 2019, it's Money for the Rest of Us, 10 Questions to Master Successful Investing. Cool. So I think this is a great approach. I, I, mean, I, think, uh, I think a lot of people benefit from sort of checklists or routines um, when going over, you know, m making big decisions. So I think this is a really great approach that you're, you're embracing here. So we're going to dive into it. I'm going to ask David to sort of go over at a high level his 10-question approach, and then we'll have some, some, uh, some fun at the end and sort of apply it to uh, some everyday personal finance decisions, if, that, uh, if that's cool, Dave. Yeah, it works for me. Awesome. All right, let's uh, let's get into it. Can you can you sort of dive into the first question of uh, your 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 ten question approach? Well, sure. But before I do that, maybe I should set the stage. I you know I've spent about seventeen years as an institutional investment advisor, researching money managers, making asset allocation recommendations to institutions, managing money, and so these ten questions really come out of that process of managing money, and then doing the podcast individuals are always asking, how do I invest? And, and one of the things I find is when individuals want to learn to invest, and, and that's a great thing, they often completely go down the wrong rabbit hole. And so, and when I was kind of looking at the, the investment books out there, there's a lot of investment books that are, are down there in the rabbit hole. How do you invest in real estate? How do you be, you know, pick value stocks? And I didn't really see something that would step back and provide a framework to figure out, should I be investing in real estate? Should I be investing in cryptocurrencies? And so these, these 10 questions, this framework comes up out of how, how I invest and how I teach others to invest. But I, more than importantly, I think these are really guardrails. And as you mentioned, a checklist, just to make sure that we're, we know what's going on. Because we can't, Annie Duke, who wrote the book, A Thinking Invest, are thinking and bets. She recommended or endorsed the book and you know, read through it. And, and her point is in the, one of my lead quotes in the intro is we can't control investment outcomes and a bad investment outcome is not because we made a bad decision. We can sometimes make very good decisions by having a framework and the outcome doesn't always work out like we want, but if we actually have that checklist or framework. Oftentimes we'll, We'll do a better job. And oh, so I totally this agree. is so. Yeah, having a great system in place is more important than any one good outcome. I mean, if you're doing the right approach, just, you know, if, but if you don't have the confidence in your approach, perhaps one failed investment will make you sort of bail out of an area where you should be involved in because you lack confidence in the overall approach, if, if that makes sense, the overall system of your investing approach. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so the first question is simply kind of the lead question what is it? In that, you know, many investors, when they go into, well, let's take Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. <laughs> many people wanted to buy cryptocurrencies, but if you ask them to explain what it is, how it works, they couldn't do it. And so I had a, one of my first institutional clients with a college endowment and the investment committee chair basically said that on our investment committee then we shouldn't invest. And the act of explaining actually keeps us humble. And we realize that maybe we don't know everything we, we, we think that we do. Now, we're never gonna know everything about an investment, but, but just going through the act of explaining. And so the, the other nine questions really are just answering that first question, to be able to explain what the investment is. And then the second question is really a, well, David, before you go forward, I mean, Bitcoin is a great example, yeah. but what are maybe some other examples of investments out there where folks really don't quite grasp it and maybe need to make sure they understand before they move, move forward to the next step? I mean, Bitcoin is a great example just because it's in the headlines, but what are some other examples? Yeah? Well, another example would be just trading oil in the sense that the oil, pr oil price falls and then people say, well, I want to, like, I think oil is going to rebound, so I want to go buy oil. Well, you, you can't buy oil. 
I mean, you, you can't go. It's not like gold. You can buy gold coins. You can't go buy a barrel of, of oil. So you're actually buying an oil futures contract, right. which an oil futures contract makes money not if oil goes up in price. It makes money if it goes up in price more than what's already reflected in that futures contract. Right. So if oil is selling you know, in the futures market, let's say 60 days out at $36 a barrel and oil is at $30 a barrel, if oil goes up to $34 a barrel, you lose money. And you see this in even commodity ETFs. There's commodity, the agriculture ETFs, for example. I looked at one the other day. Year after year, it, it loses money even though agriculture products are going up in price and they lose money because they keep they, they never go up in price more than what's priced into the contract. Enough, right. So they roll it over and they are always losing money. So that, I, that's another example. I am going to slightly disagree with you on the you can't own oil only because there's this hilarious TV show where these uh, the char- main characters decide to invest in gasoline prices because they think they're going to go up. So they, they start buying barrels of gas and storing them in their basement. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> so you can do it. <laughs> well, you you can do it, but it's easy. Uh, it's hard to liquidate. Not recommended, of course. If you want. <laughs> right. Well, and and I mean, that's an aspect of oil. I mean, that that's actually priced in. You know, the storage cost is one of the things that impacts the the right. future price of oil because there are people that have done that, but they've rented huge oil tankers to store the oil offshore. <laughs> then. So the, that really the second question allows us to really simplify or categorize the, the investment universe. And, and the question is, is it investing, speculating or gambling in Bitcoin and oil futures? That's an example of speculating and where there's and, and by speculation. What that means is there's there's a disagreement on what the price should be. And it's really a binary outcome. You're either going to get it right, and so it's going to be worth more in the future than it is today, and you'll make money, or you're not, and it's going to be worth less. And that's different from investing, because investing, it has a positive expected return, typically because there's some cash flow component to it or an income. Real estate's an investment because you're collecting rents. Stocks are an investment because there's the dividend. And because there's cash flow and you can value that cash flow, that's what an investment is. Whereas the speculation is there isn't any cash flow. And so the only way to make money with a speculation is somebody will pay more in the future. Now, speculations aren't bad. We just have to recognize that we don't want our retirement based on speculation. We want the workhorse of our portfolio to be investing. And then gambling is something with a negative expected return. You, you do it for entertainment. You go to Vegas, you're there to be entertained. But we, we don't want our investments to be something that's there for, that has a negative expected return. And, and there's not a whole lot of investments out there that are gambles, but there are some. And even if we don't have a good understanding of an investment, it might be a, a speculation or an investment for somebody else, but it could be a gamble for us because we didn't really understand what we were doing. So a couple questions. By that definition, by your, by your definition of a uh, speculation, does that necessarily make any non-dividend paying equity, such as Amazon, for example, more speculative than an investment? No, because Amazon still has cash flow. So they might not be paying a dividend yet. And there's a lot of stocks that don't pay dividends, but they still generally have earnings. And they have cash flow. So you can value it. And that's the other distinction. You can actually, you know, place, there's a price to earnings ratio mm-hmm. on Amazon. There is no price to earnings ratio on gold right. or Bitcoin because there isn't any way to, to figure out is this price, is this over or undervalued? Right. Now, more and more with the way the, the private and public markets have involved, there are definitely some stocks that, that are pretty close to, to speculation. <laughs> Uber, for example. I mean, stocks that, that, they went public and have no I still don't have a business model that's profitable at all. And yet they're dumped on the public market. And yeah, that, that type of investing is a little bit speculative. So one would be one. Go ahead. Oh, please. So I was going on to the next question. So okay, go okay ahead great. And, uh, I have one more, in, uh, one more question on this point. So does it, it seems to me that one of the major problems with this, you know, step in the rules is that, would you agree that most of us are pretty poor evaluators 
<laughs> of whether or not something's an investment, a gamble, or a speculation. And that, and that might be one of the key forks where we start making bad decisions. Well, I, I do. But I don't think it's hard to figure out. I mean, if, if, the, if there isn't any cash flow being generated, then it's either a speculation or a gamble. So it's, I mean, that's almost like a bright line rule, you would say, yeah? Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Cool. I mean, there, there's exceptions. Like we talked about, you know, a, a stock that has losing massive amounts of money and pays no dividend. But generally speaking, I mean, antiques are speculation. Sure. Gold's a speculation. Anything where the outcome is binary and you have to be absolutely right about the price going up. A stock might not go up in price, but because it's paying a dividend, you can still make money, which is why it has a positive expected return. Where the speculation has to go up in price in order to make money because there is no income stream associated with it. Cool. Makes sense. And then, so the next two question is what is the upside and the downside really gets to, to figuring out, well, what is that expected return? And the, and the rule of thumb for, for an investment is that the long-term return is, is driven by that income stream. So it's driven by the dividend yield or the interest from a bond. And then it's driven by whether that income stream is growing over time which is another aspect of you know, what's a long-term return. And then the third element is what is the, you know, what are investors willing to pay for that cash flow or that income stream? And during periods where they're paying a lot of money for it, then expected returns will be lower. And if, they're, if they don't want to own it at all or they, they get very, very cheap, then your expected return will be higher. So that's really the upside is what's, what's the expected return? And, and I go, you know, in the book, I go through rules of thumb for trying to, you know, great detail for how, how to estimate that. The downside is simply how much could you lose? And you know, risk, in my perspective, isn't volatility. We're, we're much more concerned about downside volatility, losing money. But losing money is not necessarily a reason not to invest. What we need to be aware of is what is the financial harm caused by that loss. If you're near retirement and you're 90% in stocks and the stock market falls 60%, then you can be very harmed. Whereas if you're a young investor, you, you don't, your portfolio is not very large. You can accept some of those losses. And so that's really, you know, downside is understanding the risk in terms of the maximum potential loss and the financial harm caused by that loss. Yeah, as being uh, me personally, as a second generation, I guess, Korean American immigrant, uh, having seen my parents' generations and all my friends' parents, I think uh, there's an underappreciation of the downside risk of losing to inflation. There's a lot of mattress stuffing and, you know, sub 1% interest rate investing, or I, I wouldn't even call it investing, um, where, from, from folks who maybe come from backgrounds where, you know, bank runs happened a little bit more, or there's just a fear that, that you know, they, they want that, quote unquote, uh, complete security that the cash will never disappear, but they lose so much to the time value of money. Um, I mean, that, how, how would you, uh, I guess? No, I agree. I, absolutely. So, I mean, you can't focus strictly on on the potential loss because there is that loss yeah. due to inflation which means as investors we we need to be willing to recognize that sometimes investments go down i mean the stock market will go down frequently yeah five you know five to six percent several times a year 15 20 percent we just have to recognize that but ultimately, so when we look at when we're looking at returns, we want to look at you know what is that expected return relative to inflation? Are you getting some type of real return above that? With cash right now, you're not. I mean, you basically you know cash is at two percent. You're, you're pretty much where inflation is, but thirty-year long-term bonds, you're not going to get inflation. You're not going to beat inflation right now because the yields are closer to to basically one point nine percent. So that's really what the fourth question is. The fifth is really stepping back and thinking whenever we, if you go out and buy a car, you're very aware of who's selling that car to you. If it's a used car, you, you, you're extremely cognizant, like who's selling this to me? Why are they selling it? Mm -hmm. And so we're, we understand who's on the other side of, of that car transaction. But we often don't do that in the financial markets. We just go out and we buy a stock and never think about, well, who's who are the majority of individual or the entities actually participating in the stock market. When Benjamin Graham wrote his classic t tome on value investing back in the late 40s, most stocks and stock tradings were owned by individuals. 
So as a, a dedicated research he, researcher, he could get an informational edge to understand, all right, I believe this stock is mispriced. And then he was rewarded for his due diligence. Now, most stocks are owned and traded by institutions and algorithms. So as an individual, when we're saying, I want to buy Amazon, we're saying everyone's wrong, that I believe that this stock is, is, is too cheap, mm -hmm. that the market has underestimated the earnings growth and the potential of Amazon. Because all a stock is, it's the intrinsic value or the correct value of a stock is a reflection of its future cash flow stream put in today's dollars. And so if, if the stock is not price right, it means somebody has underestimated what that future cash flow stream is. And so it's very important to understand who are we trading with? And that's the pr primary reason I don't buy individual stocks. I, I want to own baskets of stocks through exchange traded funds or index funds, because then I don't have to be figuring out is which stock is priced right. I know some will be priced wrong and they'll surprise to the upside and some will be be overvalued and and get hit. But overall, those cancel each other out. And then I'll benefit from the income stream in terms of dividends and how that income stream grows over time. Cool. So that's an important component to it. A uh, sixth is really what's the investment vehicle. And once we understand what drives the return, we want to understand the other aspects about investments and you know, what's their liquidity, what's their fees, what's their structure. And, and that's kind of a key understanding. You get that information from a, a pers the prospectus Specs, or the offering mem memorandum. Uh, seven is what does it take to be successful? And this gets really to understand, again, what are the return drivers of the particular investment? You know, is it income? Is it cash flow? Is there leverage? I mean, some investments, I see people go into real estate all the time and they don't separate out that you know, their return isn't so much being driven by the cash flow components of the deal, but it's being magnified, magnified significantly by the leverage. And so we understand you know, what is it that it drives that return. Uh, eight is who's getting a cut. In yeah, terms this is a of huge fees. one. <laughs> and, you know, there's fees, you know, taxes is a fee. I often get, get you know, listeners complain about the, the taxes they have to pay. But sure. successful investing means you pay taxes. And you just have to recognize that that's the cost. You know, paying an advisor, that's a cost. Yeah, I mean, it's fine to have an investment advisor, but recognize, you know, why am I owning that? Why am I hiring an advisor? If I'm hiring them because I think they can outperform and outsmart the market, that's not a very good reason to hire an investment advisor. If you're doing it for peace of mind or you don't have time, and the fees are reasonable, then, then you hire advisors. But just recognize, you know, what is the cost? Who's taking a portion of the return in terms of fees? And then nine is, is how does it impact your portfolio? Most of the time when we buy an investment, we're looking at it on a standalone basis. But we, under, we want to understand, you know, why, you know, how does it contribute to our portfolio? And I, I you know, we don't have to go into that there. You know, my approach is, is really an, an asset garden approach where, as investors, we can't optimize a portfolio. We can do it like a, a garden. You don't optimize a flower garden. <laughs> you just have a variety of plants, a variety of bushes that you know, produce fruit. And, and we do the same thing with investing because you know, a lot of the, the theory around portfolio construction, what's known as modern portfolio theory, you know, it's, there's all kinds of nested assumptions in there. And I find that many of the assumptions they're mere guesses. Oh, yep. For example, you own an apartment building. What's the volatility of an apartment building? Because that's the input to, to an asset allocation study is what's the volatility. Well, there is no volatility in an apartment building because it's not valued every day. And so these type of, of non-public investments that you have to basically make up assumptions to fit them into this model. And so I, I think as individuals, we don't, we don't have to, to use an asset allocation model an investment advisor does because they manage hundreds of accounts. Sure. But as individuals, we just want diversification is good. And so we want a variety of return drivers in our portfolio. And that's how we approach it. And then the final question is just, you know, once you have the other one, should you invest? Figuring out well, how much to invest, what's the timing of the investing? I often get questions, you know, individuals ask me all the time, should I if I get a big bonus or an inheritance, should I invest it all at once mm -hmm. or dollar cost average? The numbers say 
invest it all at once because the stock market usually goes up. Most people are better dollar cost averaging because they're better able to control their emotion and they're trying to, to, to minimize what Ben Hunt says, minimize your maximum regret. And so if you put it all in at once, at once and the market falls 30% that first month, you feel terrible. And so by dollar cost averaging over time, you, you sort of avoid that feeling of regret. And that's when it comes to any investment, we want to manage that regret and then, you know, never put so much in our portfolio that again, a, a particular holding that if it fell, we would be severely harmed. Do you ever see that article? I think it was a blog post, the world's worst investor as this has to do with dollar cost averaging. Uh, it was a hypothetical person <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. who, this is sort of a back-tested t- kind of study, who invested at the top of every market, like right before every crash. Right. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, he would invest on the day before the dot-com crash, and the day after, he would accumulate, 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 until the day before the, I guess the next one would be the uh, housing crisis crash. Right? And then he would invest the day before that. And, um, and th- the point of this article was to show that um, even in those scenarios, it's not that far. The re- overall returns are not too bad or like too far off of dollar cost averaging. So like even if you are literally the world's worst investor in history, um, as you pointed out, because the market generally goes up anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad for, 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 that, for that hypothetical person. No, I, ha- I haven't seen that. But I, I think, you know, I, that, that makes sense. Yeah. But we're humans as investors and, and just if you get a big bonus, you know, it's, it gets, it's hard to get used to making those bigger trades. Mm. And so just doing it over time, in my mind, it's how I do it. It makes sense. Even though the numbers would argue, just put it in all at once. All right. Thank you for that uh, sort of high level overview. I mean, um, uh, there's a lot more depth to it in, in David's book, um, titled, same title as your podcast, correct? Uh, Money for the Rest of Us? Yes. Cool. Uh, but you know what? Let's let's apply that that checklist and that philosophy to uh, to a couple of sort of everyday personal finance decisions. And Dave, I'm, I'm not saying that we should go one through ten on every one of these, but just kind of loosely go over them and and see where we land, uh, or you know, see where you, how you advise your friend, your neighbor, one of your listeners. Uh, so let's start with home ownership. You know, what what are some of the key questions uh, we should be asking ourselves before deciding if home ownership is the right investment for us? Yeah. Well, I think with home ownership, you know, houses depreciate just like cars. Yeah. So unless you're constantly putting money into a house, then it's gonna fall in value. I mean, I've, I, I've seen it. I mean, I've, we built a house in 2005 in Idaho at the top of the housing market. Now, it was done at $100 a square foot, so significantly cheaper than other areas of the country. Yet seven years later, that house sold for $85 a square foot. And what, what you see with home ownership is people think they're making money on their house, and it isn't so much that the house is appreciating, it's because they're so highly levered, because they've gone out and they've borrowed 80 to 90% in a mortgage and then invested. So then if it goes, let's say, a little bit by inflation, then, they, then they, they're building up their equity. But that's separate. So we need to, and that's, a, that's an example of understanding what does it take to be successful. Mm-hmm. You saw when, in the housing crash, it, when housing, what it takes to be successful is, is that the prices don't go down in a period where you have 90% leverage and, and then, you, then you're in trouble. Yeah. And so home, home ownership is a great example. I mean, when you buy a home, you buy it for a lifestyle reason, typically. Mm-hmm. It, you know, over time, I mean, there's pockets where home ownership makes money. When Idaho, for example, where we are making money on our house. We sold our house. We made money. Well, we made money because there's a lot of people from California moving to Idaho. So you, there's, there's things that influence that. Wait, wait, wait. Why is that happening? Any, can, you, can you explain that a little well, bit? Well, the price, yeah. Well, cost of living in California is much higher than Idaho. So, you know, houses, we just sold our house for $100 a square foot. Houses Isn't that like in, a big climate change, though? <laughs> Going from well, California to... <laughs> you know, they're, 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 well, which is why, you know, housing in California are four hundred dollars square foot <laughs> and they're only a hundred here, but they used to be eighty. And so okay. and there's a there's way more people in California that are willing to uh, suffer the, the winters. 
Uh, we're not. We spend our winters in, in Arizona, so we don't uh, we don't deal with that. Are you currently a homeowner? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, yeah. So we own we own uh, uh, a cabin up in in Idaho, and the, as well as a home in Phoenix. So and, and but I go in when I buy a house. I just assume we're gonna tread water. And I buy a house because, and we don't have any mortgage, so we pay cash. And I just, you know, if it goes up, fine. But I, I choose a house for the lifestyle reason. And just because we prefer, I mean, I podcast, so I don't really want to be in an apartment because then, you know, we've got neighbors walking upstairs. So, but you, you own a house for lifestyle reason. Totally agree. Totally agree. Cool. Next, uh, next big investment. And this is just kind of what we've been talking about recently on our show. College. Is it worth it? Let's think of it as an investment. Is college worth it for our it kids? Is. I would assume. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is. I mean, college, college is an, it's a different type of investment. It's an investment in your human capital. Mm -hmm. So it's your earnings power over life. The data still suggests that you know going to college, uh, if if you learn and you pick up those skills, that it pays off over time. It's interesting with the presidential election. The some of the proposals is everyone should go to college for free. Well, if that happens, it'll be interesting because then you have a much larger candidate pool for college. And then it makes you wonder whether well, the return on that investment, well, in this case, I mean, it wouldn't be, <laughs> it wouldn't cost very much money, I guess, room and board. But then potentially there wouldn't be, it's sort of like high school today. Like diluting the, the value you know, of the, yeah. Diluting the value of the college education. But yeah, clearly college is, a, is an investment in, in your human capital and does pay well, off. What about this thought experiment? We did this on a couple, a couple of shows ago. So um, I, did, I did a little look, uh, digging, and apparently the lifetime value of a college degree versus a you know, two-year degree or a high school graduate is about a million dollars over your lifetime, rough, more or less. Right. Now, if you, instead of attending college, uh, let's say it's 25000 a year. I think that's roughly average, so about $100,000 um, for your total cost of your four-year education. And that's probably on the cheap side versus some of these private or northeastern schools. But if you took that $100,000 and you sort of dripped it into your Roth IRA over the, over, from eight years 18 to 28, by the time you're, I think it was 65, maybe 62, you'll have well over a million dollars without having to work. <laughs> so, um, I mean, does that, does, that, does that thought process, what do you think about that analysis, for example? Well, it, it depends on what rate of return you used. Yeah, that, we, I think we used seven or eight percent compounding annually. You know, we didn't do anything crazy there, and it, right. again, in a Roth, no taxes. You know, so right. Well, it it again, it's a different investment. Yeah. So you know, I I would go with the college investment because it, because you're investing in the human capital, you have a lot more f flexibility, you can control your outcome more than being dependent on the stock market. So. I'd, I'd focus on college. Now, there's there's ways to do college to get a better return on investment. I mean, you can go to a community college for a couple of years. When you go to college, you can go not just thinking, well, I'm going to go to college, so I'll make more money. But you, you go wanting to learn a particular skill. And so that's, that's key. Yeah, there's plenty of even pre, you, you know, you mentioned the, the presidential chats about free college. I mean, even now, before all that, there's plenty of states that have merit-based or need-based free four-year colleges, not just, uh, not just associate degrees. So there are ways to get the, uh, the value degree, as it were. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what about uh, financial advisors? You kind of touched on that briefly before, but uh, you know, is that something that's worth, you know, uh, to young parents or mid-career parents, is it worth investing in an FA? Is it, is it a good outcome for them? Or ROI, I guess you, well, I should say. Well, I, I think you know, hiring someone to do a financial plan on a project basis makes sense. It can be very helpful. Sure. I think hiring an investment advisor on a, an ongoing basis, it comes down to, you know, who's getting a cut. You know, what are the fees and what are you getting for that? It, you know, oftentimes it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's investing is not that hard that someone can't learn to invest in some index funds, put together a diversified portfolio. So if you have the plan that an advisor put together for you, it's it's pretty cost effective that you can implement that on your own. Some people just don't want anything to do with it. Just make sure the fees are cheap and you, and you don't hire you know, advisors. There, there are very few investment advisors that can outperform the market yep. because if they could, they would be running hedge funds 
and wouldn't be a financial advisor. <laughs> so you don't hire an advisor because you think they're, they're smart and they're going to protect you in a down market. You hire an advisor to, to, to help you put together a plan. And then if you want to outsource implementation, that's certainly possible, but assume that they'll, they'll match the market and you'll trail the market net of whatever their fees are. What are your thoughts on the the these this new crop of robo advisors? I think there's one called Betterment. I think there's a few other competitors. You have any thoughts on those uh, as an alternative to the financial advisors? Well, most of them aren't doing giving necessarily financial advice. It's an it's an algorithm, it, and so they're basically buying a pool uh, of index funds or ETFs. I mean, it's not anything you can couldn't do on your own. I mean, their their fees are reasonable. So I mean, there are many people that want to participate in them and I, I don't have a big issue with that i, I don't i don't use it because i i think it's cheaper there's cheaper alternatives i mean there's apps out there that you can basically buy etfs with no commissions and put the i mean there's there's zero fee index funds that fidelity own so you don't need to pay a robo advisor to buy some index funds you, you can implement that on your own so we, we you just mentioned briefly a, a little bit about allocation have you do you have thoughts on uh, on Buffett's sort of proposed 90-10 allocation? Did you hear about that from his shareholder letter a few years ago? I did. I did, I did a podcast on it, and and I think that was the – I'm trying to think exactly. Well, he said he read so many of his shareholders' letters. Yeah, I think it was like well, I mean, 2016. I'm not sure exactly either, yeah. So re, you know, refresh my memory on, on your perspective. What, what sure, my understanding at. is that he mentioned in one of his – a shareholder letter within the past five years that in his will, or I think he meant his trust, um, his instruction to his executor for his surviving wife or spouse would be uh, 90% in, he actually specified Vanguard uh, index funds, S&P index funds, and the remaining 10% in uh, short-term, uh, I think he said money, uh, short-term uh, munis, I think he said. Okay. Cash, essentially, yeah. Um, and that was how he would have his like this is what he has in his estate plan for his surviving spouse. So it comes off as first, you know, it's authoritative because it's Warren Buffett, and it's um, right. it feels credible because he's say, he's saying that he has this in his will for his wife. <laughs> well, right. So so the thing about that, <clears throat> what's the downside of that allocation? You know, if the stock market falls sixty percent, mm -hmm. then that portfolio will be down fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So the I don't know what his net worth is. The $100 billion portfolio is now worth $50 billion. Now, there is no downside. I mean, when you have that much money, mm -hmm. at this point, you're investing for posterity. You you don't need the money to, to live on, so it makes sense to be, to be very, very aggressive in your investing. If you're a typical retiree that might have the, a half a million dollar portfolio or a million dollar portfolio, mm -hmm. and it's cut in half, even if you're using let's say you're using the 4% rule where you're spending 4% in your first year of retirement and then increase it by the rate of inflation. Well, if the portfolio falls in, in half, you're then spending 8% of your portfolio and the, the money that was expected to last 35 years might only last 20 years. Well, I think that's what so the 10% is for, right? So then you have two and a half years to draw on your cash before you're diving into your principal and, and selling off these losses. I mean, isn't that what the 10% is for? Correct, but the the average recovery period for stocks, you know, after a fifty percent drawdown, is four to five years. Sure. So, you know, in my mind, you know, I would not be comfortable with a ninety ten allocation for a retiree, in, a, a, at all, just because I don't. You know, we hear stocks for the long run. There have been times over twenty thirty year periods when bonds have outperformed stocks, right. and so I don't. I, I don't think retirees should be that aggressive. In, in their allocation, unless you have a sufficient pool of money that if that 50% drawdown hits, your lifestyle is not harmed. And that gets back to figuring out the downside. The downside isn't the loss. The downside is the personal impact on, on, of that loss on your lifestyle. Right. Because in that scenario, it's not a recognized loss. It's paper loss until it picks back up, right? So there was exactly. actually a, a study done by um, some, somebody back tested this, basically. Uh, and I, I'm not a big fan of back testing. I mean, Past doesn't necessarily predict the future, but just for the sake of having a conversation, somebody actually ran this. Um, somebody ran ninety ten 
versus 80-20 versus 60-40, you know, sort of the traditional, and all the way, you know, the whole spectrum of different allocations. And the, the findings were actually pretty interesting. So 60-40, meaning 60% equities, 40% um, bonds, had a 0% zero, zero incidence of running out of money. And the definition for the purposes of this study was uh, being able to live out your 4% drawdowns for 30 years past retirement. So they never ran out of money with a 60-40 allocation, which was, I mean, that's the safe way of approaching it. However, the downside to that was they were squeaking it out at the end a lot of times, meaning they were basically barely making it. On the other side, 90-10 had a failure rate, and a failure rate means not quite, doesn't mean that you're broke the first year of your retirement, but at some point you, you didn't make it, you know, you didn't make it all the way to the full 30 years. But a failure rate was still under 2% of the time. I mean, that, I don't know if that sounds a lot to, like a lot to you or a little, but sub 2%. And the well, upside, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. It depends on where the equity allocation is. If you were in the Japanese stock market, you lived in Japan, and you had, did that same analysis, mm -hmm. and were spending 4%, you'd run out of money. Yeah. You need to be spending 2%. And so it, it depends on... And that's I the think this was the S&P, yeah, yeah, just to follow right. Buffett's I mean, model. They were the U.S., right. So if yeah. it's U.S., but is that going to be the case going forward? Exactly. Exactly what I'm not a fan divot, of backtesting. <laughs> divot, dividend yields are 2%, whereas for the global stock market, they're over 3%, yeah. where the, the P-E ratio on a cyclically adjusted basis for U.S. stocks is 28 versus non-U.S. stocks where it's 15 or 16. And so that's why you know I'm not a fan sure. of using historical returns at all in terms of, of allocation. In fact, when, uh, I'm in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do upset on the, on the I've read a, some recent books on the FIRE movement, the Financial Independence Retire Early Movement, which I, I think is great. I think choosing FI is great. My problem with it is it's typically based on historical returns. And yeah, it worked out historically, but we have to look at what are conditions today. And this gets back to the figuring out the upside. You know, what are valuations you know what are what are bond yields right now and and, and go about it that way and so it, it kind of depends and the other thing when you when you do you know i've read books on uh, these back tests we've had one return series for the sp500 if you actually rearrange the returns mm -hmm. so they didn't happen in the yearly pattern that we've had the the success the success rate isn't as quite as high so part of it is when did you start and another example of this. So I, I was talking to a guy from Alaska the other day. He just retired. He worked for the state of Alaska and was absolutely thrilled that in Alaska, those that work for the state don't get to participate in Social Security. Instead, you get to invest all that money in, in the market is how he, he said it. And as I thought about it, you know, I was alarmed because he started investing in the early 80s. And you know, he had this huge tailwind. And so not being a part of Social Security worked out for him great. But if you were an investor that starting today and you don't get sort of that potential annuity stream of Social Security and it's all dependent on what happens to the stock market, I wouldn't want to be in that situation. So it kind of depends on where we're at. Cool. All right, David, last question, just because it's the hot topic out there. And you kind of touched on it before, but what role should Bitcoin play in our portfolios? I mean, acknowledging that it's uh, speculative, you know, checking that off, we, we acknowledge that this is a speculation, uh, or any or any or any crypto. Uh, you know, where should that where, where should that fall in? Especially when where it's talked about as a um, as an alternative, if not a s potential replacement for fiat, you know, for the dollar, essentially. Yeah? Right. Yeah. Well, the, you know, my rule for speculation is only put it an amount of money in that speculation that you're willing to lose if you lose it all. So I have about 1% of my net worth in cryptocurrencies. I, I think they're a revolutionary invention. Whether they'll be successful or not depends on whether people trust it. I mean, just like with any currency, the dollar is strong because people trust it or, this, or people invest in gold because they, they trust that it will hold its value. It's the same way for cryptocurrencies. So Typically, you know, in case, you know, I have less, less than 1% it, or about 1%. Is it but all Bitcoin or have you tried other, uh, other coins? No, I mean, it's, it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin. Yeah. I mean, there's a number of different ones. I mean, the, the thing that concerns me about Bitcoin that I'm still 
is just the, the sheer environmental cost because it's mm. it's based on what's known as proof of work. So you have this network with all the participants, you know, they don't trust each other. And then they validate the transactions by, you know, solving algorithms, et cetera. You know, that's different than you know, Facebook Libra, which has got a lot of criticism, but the Libra is an example what's called, known as proof of stake. You have a closed network that trust each other that are validating the transactions. And as a result, they're not you know, spending so much in terms of energy consumption and environmental cost validating transactions when it comes out. And so and there's some things about Bitcoin that I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with. And, you know, as the price spikes, then the energy usage spikes. And so there is an environmental cost of that. And so, that, I mean, they're, you know, hopefully they'll work out a way to kind of reduce that. I've talked about validating transactions you now away from the primary blockchain and things of that sort. But it's a speculation. Totally. All right, man. David, thanks so much for, for going over this with us. Um, your book launches on, did you say it was October 25th? October 25th. So, uh, no, thanks. It's been, yeah. been great. Cool. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you got something out of these 10 um, steps, I'll call them, for deciding when and where to invest. Thank you, David, for joining us. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Take care. Great. Thanks. All righty.